So, uh, it's a great pleasure on this first meeting to welcome Dr. Ernesto Cortesa. Uh, Ernesto has uh, a foot in, in two camps. Um, he was with RGU at St. Andrew Street for a while, then he joined us at the University of Aberdeen and was a colleague in the APAT, uh, Advanced Knowledge Technologies, and is continuing to work at the uh, University of Aberdeen, but is now getting involved in a spin off company, which is going to tell us something about. So, hello everybody. Now, my name is well known. I'm assisted by Ryan and this is going to be a sort of double act with me doing the talking, Ryan doing the presentation. So I'll uh, say a few things uh, halfway through the presentation. Ryan will uh, step in, uh, demo the system, then I will continue with other situations and that's it. Then afterwards questions and answers. A few things about us. As Peter said, uh, I'm wearing two hats, but uh, tonight is just going to be not my academic hat, but my company hat. Technabling was established in 2009 to try to exploit the research that we have done in uh, assisted independent living and particular application of assisted independent living to, uh, that uses advanced video recognition and analysis technologies. So that's the idea. One interesting thing about enabling, the only thing I want to mention is differently from other spin-off companies, we completely own and we own from day one all the IP that we needed to develop our things, which means we are completely independent of any academic influence in the sort. And we exploit that and use that. Is there a blinking issue so that, yeah. that will disappear once I go on with uh, my overhead? So, well, we hope so. Sorry? We hope so. Yes. Right, so let's try to exploit that immediately and I will explain you all the logos later on. Uh, basically, what is the portable sign language first and foremost? It is an application that by the contractual definition with the, the funders, which is the UK government at the top of the hierarchy, transforms uh, hand gestures as used by deaf people, particularly profoundly deaf people, either into well, either, well, it's fine, we can, we can live with that. I, I think so. Either into text or into controls. And what's, that's what's available now. That's what, what's going to be available in 2014 is going to be the, the other way around. So moving from text back to gestures. Now, why uh, only one way at the moment? Because this is what we were contracted to develop. And this is really challenging things. So identifying and tracking gestures while a uh, hand is moving is the challenging scientifically and technologically part of the whole thing. Uh, as I was saying, we have a part uh, one from gesture to comments or from gesture to text. What we will have in 2014, because we decided we want to go for that following feedback, is the other way around. Okay, so that's the PSLT in a nutshell. Now, my idea is, okay, what's the talk? motivations and background for why we are there, why the PSLT, some features. Ryan will show you a demo of the PSLT in action. I will discuss some technical challenges and on top of that I will discuss and introduce social, cultural and more mundane issues which are as equally important as the technical challenges because we do have a problem potentially here in terms of uh, the adoption of the technology. It's not just our technology, any technology in this in this area. Okay, a few things on the wider applicability of video-based analysis, so what we can do can be applied to different contexts. Fine. So, why the PSOT? Around <coughs> 100,000 people in the UK are deaf and uh, use sign language. Most of uh, uh, sign language users in this country use British sign language, mostly but not exclusively. Now, I would like to point out one thing. When we say deaf, there are two kinds of deaf people. There are those called the culturally deaf, which are, yes, deaf, but they can sort of understand people by lip reading, or they became deaf later in life, so they have a, a better understanding of uh, written text, etc., etc., etc. Is BSL and the PSLT PSL for them? Yes and no. Then we have the profoundly or severely deaf people. These are guys who unfortunately are born deaf. So they have difficulties with the written text and definitely for them it's not a matter of choice. They basically have no other option left. 
but to use sign language in communication. And uh, obviously that's the point. Now, the other point, as you know, is that most people like us who can talk, they don't know sign language. And I don't see a big rush in the wider community to learn sign language. The point is sign language is limited to deaf people and to those ones who are the network of support around deaf people who can be members of family, friends. That's the limitation. So we know that the wider community is not really uh, going uh, into sign language. I mean, the wider community is not even going into foreign languages. Imagine something like sign language. We do have a problem. But obviously, we would have a, a solution. Uh, now, the other... Um, problem here is in a number of situations, and this is what triggered originally the PSAT from the government, in a number of situations people who are profoundly deaf are at the margin or completely excluded from the labor market because they can't interoperate with the, the rest of the workforce or their teammates. Nowadays any sort of job is going to be more and more team-based and uh, working in a splendid isolation is no more the case in a number of situations, particularly if you want to do a more professional job. So the point is, uh, there is this gap between uh, signers and speakers, and one of the aims of the, uh, this project is to try to bridge this gap, to empower signers with the possibility of communicating whatever they want to communicate using any sort of jargon, any sort of sophisticated term that typically sign language as such may or may not include, but that definitely non signers won't understand. So I was talking uh, with the uh, uh, West Yorkshire police a few days ago and they said, well, you know, uh, we have these people who come uh, terrified and they're deaf because in North Yorkshire there is a wide community, there are also a number of national colleges that uh, specifically uh, focus on deaf people and from time to time you have a profoundly deaf person that enters a police station and tries to do gestures to explain about a crime or uh, something serious that has happened and the police behind the counter they, yeah, well, yes, what well, I don't understand, sorry, but Okay, so this is a, a wider than you can imagine issue. It's not just uh, 100,000 or 70,000 profoundly deaf users in the UK, but it's also the wider community around that. So that's the context. Either other issue about the context is, uh, yes, we do have interpreters, we do have middlemen, so people who stand between the signer and the speaker to translate sign language into text, and uh, oh, voice, and uh, voice in back into sign language. What's the bottom line? There are few of them. They are expensive. In general, if you want to, uh, to have a conversation with somebody who can speak, you have to book a sign uh, an interpreter in advance. And this can be days in advance. The cost is available, it's a very scarce resource, and typically works Monday to Friday, nine to five. Okay? So if you have a problem on a Saturday night, yeah. By the way, I was a few months ago, we were in Heathrow, Wednesday at 4 p.m. And a colleague asked the reception in Heathrow, look, uh, what happens I, if I am deaf and I need a, a, an interpreter just now? Heathrow, Wednesday, 4 p.m. We don't have any. Okay? So this gives you an idea of how serious the situation is. They are really a scarce resource. On top of that, if you have a sign language translator, an automated tool, this can help people to learn the language. It's a self-training and a, a, a self-learning support tool. Obviously, the other pro problem with trying to learn sign language is given the uh, scarcity of interpreters, there is also a scarcity of teachers and instructors, which means that, oh gosh, if I have to learn sign language, I have, I have to go to this place, maybe in Aberdeen there isn't any course, at the moment I have to go to Peterhead, and it's uh, twice per week, etc, etc. There are bias to that, so this is the, yeah, the issue. So, the other thing is, right, okay, sign language, I'm a perfect, I am a signer, the other person understands my signing. What about communicating knowledge that's a bit more sophisticated than everything, like, I mean, go to the supermarket. What about if you want, if you are in a training, you are a joiner and you want to say, can you please give me that 3.2 uh, 
a millimeters HSS drill bit because I have to make a hole here for a dovetail joint. How many words of what I have said do you think uh, BSL can capture and uh, basically convey? One or two. The rest is, forget about it. You are in tertiary education, you are talking about uh, a chemical compound, or you are talking about uh, computer science, uh, C programming language, uh, take this method and transform it uh, and, and do something else. What about BSL? No, because BSL or any other sign language is for general purpose. So the point here is, we need to empower uh, signers with the possibility of creating their own signs or using an uh, over um, or using um, existing signs to convey your own personal name. So I want to, to be able to say that this is first derivative and this is second derivative. Why not? So I can have a conversation with the tutor and say, look, I tried to do this uh, second derivative, but the result was infinitive. What can you tell me? Fine, that's empowering. Academic example, the, uh, the training example may be more interesting for the majority of uh, people who may be in training more than tertiary education, but this is the message, this is the idea. So that's the motivation. Right, now, uh, the other thing, the things behind the, the scene. Now, the UK government needs and wants new products for wider society, as they call it. So they have this double objective of trying to empower people uh, to use uh, uh, this new technology. Also because I think that once people are empowered with new technology and they say we have leveled the gap between uh, sinus and not sinus, etc, etc, you can imagine that they will tell these people now you go on with your own legs. So this is basically the thing. But I mean the objective really here is uh, to try to bridge the gap. Now, there is an initiative that's called the Small Business Research Initiative, whereas the department, what was once the uh, Department for uh, uh, Trade and uh, Work and uh, Pensions, Trade and Industry, I don't remember, now it's called Business uh, Innovation and Skills, it's always them. Uh, they basically has commissioned the Small Business Research Initiative through the Technology Strategy Board uh, with the support of this practice to have a number of codes that are reserved for small businesses, for the industry, to develop these pieces of technology. So what's the idea? No universities, please. They are barred from applying. It has to be small and medium enterprises as defined by the European community, so no more than 100, blah, 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 or no more than X minute, etc., etc. There is a call, and you have to answer this call, you have to submit a project. Uh, for, for all my academic colleagues, uh, I just to let you know, the application process and the whole thing is much tougher than applying for an EPSRC grant. The money that you get is about 50% because they are not prepared to pay for hefty university overheads just to frame the whole thing in academic terms. So it's really good value for money for the government. And the other thing is they don't want at the end of the journey, they don't want a nice pile of academic papers which say how a thing can be done. They actually want a usable product. Right, so basically the thing is, there is always a first, first it's a two-stage approach in general. You have contracts awarded for proofs of concept. If the proof of concept are successful, there is a second round where you have to apply for the market-ready commercial product which lasts longer. Right, so this is the context. This is how the whole thing came to life. By the way, the PSLT was launched as one of the earliest uh, small business research initiatives back in uh, April 2001. We won the, uh, the first stage, we had funding to go for six months, we developed and delivered the proof of concept in November 2001, we had to go for a second round of uh, application with a couple of uh, green links in London and a number of ping pong, okay, hey, we want to know this, we want to know that, we want to know the other. It's not like PSSC. you submit and it's either yes or no, maybe they ask you a few questions. Here is yes, you submit, come here, give a presentation, then you're grilled, then you are grilled by mail, they have questions, they have other questions, they have other questions, and then they decide. Right, we want the second part of it. January to June 2013, 
the project officially ended in June 2013. We are looking at commercial launch in November 2013. Is the project completely ready? It is ready for initial commercialization, pilot studies, etc. etc. Obviously, this is a completely new technology, so it will take some time to be uh, extra ready. I mean, even Windows, I mean, it was launched and it took a few years before it could become something usable. So, this is the framework. But what they want us is to have a product that can be commercialized. So, we're talking to the police, we're talking to specialist colleges, we're talking to a number of different stakeholders. So, for instance, think this is a typical application for ordering your Mac burgers from McDonald's while on the car. I mean, if you enter the shop, there is always the possibility of saying, I want Big Burger. But if you are in your car, etc., etc., and you want to order something, you don't have these many possibilities. So there, there, there are a number of ideas behind the scene on how to use this application and this technology even in other contexts which are not just, oh, I go to Asda and I have to complain because, I mean, the stuff I have bought doesn't work to the... Uh, to the counter there. Right, okay. Sorry, can I just clarify? It was 2011 at the project, sorry. Of yes. Yeah. Oops, oops, <laughs> oops, oops. Okay, now we have a number of uh, requirements that were sort of mandatory, so we couldn't do without them. Number one, sign to text. That was the challenge. They, they, they didn't bother about text to sign. We introduced that as part of uh, the feedback we got from the signers. The other is works on mobile technology. So it can't, you can't use simply a desktop, it has to work on laptop, netbooks, and finally, mobiles and platforms like smartphones and tablets. This is the ultimate target. As long as they have a camera on board, or as long as you can fit a camera there. Open source components only, no strings attached. Can I use a system XYZ from Microsoft, from maybe IBM, etc., etc.? The answer is no. Okay, that's, that's the contractual complaints. Uh, constraints. Output, what should be text, maybe sound, yes, you know about screen readers, if you can generate text then you go from text to sound, sort of, smoothly, I wouldn't say straightforwardly, but rather smoothly. And then you, the system has, the, they should have the ability to, have, to uh, basically uh, interpret commands. So if the system is connected to that webcam and I do this, curtains should go down. That's the idea there. So, Mr. Um, as you said, open source components, but you still retain the IPR. So, if somebody copies all your open source and starts selling it, then you can sue them. Maybe. It's exactly. So, the point is, uh, uh, while our technology is under our IP remit, so what we develop is not going to be open source. In developing the technology, we shouldn't be make use, should be making use of. Uh, uh, proprietary technologies, which would mean uh, a license. The other to people take exactly yes. Yeah, right. And the reason is uh, that uh, the government wants to have some sort of control, so they can say, now can you do this modification? Can you do that? Can you do the other? Other reason is, if you can't commercialize your technology within three years from the end of the project, they will size the IP and then decide what to do on their own, which also means they want this open source mechanism for all these sort of reasons, so they are not in, uh, in trouble, just in case. Right, so the other thing, last but not least, it has to run on standard <coughs> hardware, possibly on different platforms, and it has to be discrete and not obtrusive. Now, let's have a look what this may mean. That's a competitor signing gloves. Now the question is, would you like to use this one to sign? I mean, this would this shouts of stigma. Imagine you go to the post office and you want to say, give me a few stamps. Sorry. And one, two, switch on, then bam, bam, I have seen Dark Father, or what's his name? Okay, the, the guy in uh, Star Wars. Dark Dark Vader. Okay. Dark Vader, sorry. Okay, that's, that's the idea. So you really don't want this sort of stuff. By the way, the cost of this is uh, unbelievable. Every time you touch hardware, the cost, you know, better than me, that's going to be quite expensive. Now, another typical example. What about these? Well, ingenious, but again, sorry. Dan, dan, dan. Martian, uh, somebody coming from Mars at work, well, you really don't want to go for that. That's the, that's the, uh, the, the bottom line. Plug in or find another computer here. Do you want me to plug in yours? 
Yeah, if you're ready for me. Okay, if I can find the okay. entry point. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Now, and these are the things that we obviously wanted to avoid. Now, a third thing. Why not this one? You have recognized the Kinect for those ones who have uh, PlayStations, etc., etc., Xbox 306. Now, why not this one? Well, this is slightly more subtle. Number one, it is proprietary, so they said on the open source stuff that's not open source as far as I know. Number two, can you imagine going your computer in one hand, this stuff on the other, put it on the counter, say, hang on a sec, dun 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 dun. So, no, 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 no. Core features, well, the bottom line now is uh, no weird or costly devices, so basically no, no standard hardware, just off the shelf stuff. So something that doesn't say I'm using it for uh, these applications. So something like this, something like this, that standard computer equipment, and then everybody say, oh yes, the guy has a smartphone, the guy has a tablet, etc. The other thing is uh, you want to have various things inside. You want to be able to recognize VSL. You want to have your own customizable, uh, customizable sign language board so that what you can do is create my own gesture and say that's third derivative. <coughs> Fine, good, problem solved. You want to be able to capture Makaton. You know what Makaton is. It's a sort of sign language for people who also have cognitive problems. In that case, they wouldn't really say, yesterday I went to see my lecture and discuss the derivatives, like hungry, thirsty, toilet, sleep. And rather than, these people have a very limited vocabulary, rather than so have this sort of communication, you want to be able to say, this gesture means, please, can you bring me some food? You basically empower the person with a cognitive disability, with the possibility of communicating at a higher level. Because that you are creating a perfect sentence, whereas the original thing is the, the crude concept, thirst, food, whatever. Right. You have to care for regional variations. We all have dialects. I have a, a terrible Italian accent. People from London have a very different accent. Glaswegians have a very peculiar accent. The same applies in sign language. There are regional variations, so some, uh, some people say I in this way, other people say I in this way, etc, etc, or a completely different gesture. We have to cover for that, so behind the scene there has to be a database that accepts different uh, uh, gestures for the very same meaning, as well as uh, making sure that there can be overloaded meaning, so there can be a meaning which means uh, uh, detective and at the same time means the prostitute. Oh, we have to make sure that depending on context, uh, we can uh, I Yesterday I went to see the, the detective, good. Yesterday I, I, went to see the I went to see the prostitute, and it's uh, your own business, we don't want to. <laughs> right, so that's basically the, the thing. But fully customizable, to be working on a range of devices, and the other thing is, science could also be transformed into appliance common. common. I raise the hand, webcam picks it up, curtains go down because there is, a, there is a connection between this gesture specifically and the command to raise or lower the curtains. Right. Okay, now, ball is in your court, Ryan. What we're going to have is a live demo of uh, how the PSLT works. And uh, I basically I leave right in charge. And I get the fun bits. My computer show itself tag. Uh, so Nesta says, I'm uh, Ryan Russell, I work for Tech Enabling as a software engineer. Um, I graduated from Aberdeen University in 2011 and then went straight on to work with them on their, their projects. By the way, work, Ryan worked for us even before graduation. Yeah, I started with my... us in November 2010. My final year's project project was on the, uh, the carrying aid system, which is another system we use for um, helping the elderly in their own homes. I think Ernesto is possibly going to discuss that briefly towards the end. So just to fill in, 
And yes, there used to be a thing called technology transfer capitalism as a, as a sort of way of... Uh, yes. So how does, how does, briefly, how does this sort of do it way differ from the technology transfer? It's completely different because in the technology transfer case, the KTP that some of you may be acquainted yeah. with, it is sort of a company seeking academic advice and technology and support and experience to be able to develop <coughs> something. This is uh, companies uh, seeking uh, money and uh, uh, to be able to develop certain technologies they already have in a sense uh, in their own uh, skill bag. We can, and uh, we have done it, we, we can appoint uh, as consultants, academics, uh, to do the job but it is completely controlled by uh, the company, whereas in the KTP, if you appoint somebody a research assistant fellow or equivalent to do the job, it has to stay in the department, in the university, and it's sort of there is a, the control from the company viewpoint is a bit more uh, vague, if you know what I mean. Well, here, if there is an academic, this is tough for academics, because if there is an academic, uh, it is, uh, he or she is under very tough company control, so it, sort of, not, not it drives it more from the company end than from the, the, from the academic end. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the fact that simply uh, prima facie uh, academics are barred from applying tells you yeah. how. Sorry, I think we're back on the line now. Yeah, that's just up and running. All right, I'll just explain the windows that we've got up on this screen. Uh, the one on the top right here, that's just the video window, that's a fairly typical, this is what the camera's picking up, this is what the system's detecting. The one at the bottom here is our output window, so that's going to put out the translated text, so the hope is that when I do a gesture up here, the text will appear down here. At the back here, this, um, this you know, severed head window basically, is the result of the skin processing. So this is where we detect the skin pixels in the image. Okay. In reality, you'd only be seeing these two windows in the final system. Possibly not even this one, because you're going to know you, you will be there, you will know what the camera is seeing. But these are some things that we're going to adjust based on user feedback. This one's handy just to give you a, a good idea of how it works. What's going on? And um, so, not many of you know ESL. That's right, isn't it? Uh, you said you've got a little bit of experience with it, um, but I imagine no one else is really, no one's um, brilliant signers. <laughs> the words I'm looking for. I'm not a signer either. I think that's always worth pointing out at the start. It does take me a little while to do the gestures and stuff like that. I've been learning. We had someone in working with us who was learning to use sign language because he was lo losing his hearing. So I learned a few gestures here and there with him and I've learned a couple myself through the, um, the development of the system. But it's just in case you are wondering why I'm so slow at my signing or that. But we're all in it together just fine. Uh, all the signs I do will be BSL signs. If there's any that aren't, I'll make it really obvious and apparent for you so that you know. Uh, so without further ado, if I was to do the gesture for hello, which is just a rather obvious wave up in the top here, and lower my hand, then the system doesn't pick it up. <laughs> there we go, we got it that right. Okay. Okay. And what happened there was I moved my hand too far over to this side and it didn't detect it. The idea is that the gestures need to be done in a certain position, because if they're not done in the same position, it could be that it means something else. You know, something done over this side could easily be different from something over this side. And that's what these little dots are that are floating about. They are the relative positions of where it wants to see the signs. So, you see how that's touching that dot there? That just shows that that's the one that it's detecting it against. There's also a number down at the bottom there that tells you which gesture it is that's been translated. So if I keep doing the same sign over and over, you'll see that that number changes each time it detects it. And that way you can tell it's actually doing something if I do the same sign in a row. Um, if I do another one, because obviously hello is quite a, an obvious gesture, we do gestures with two hands as well. So this would be applause. <laughs> oh. 
Cheerio, Cheerio. <laughs> That's not quite what I was looking for. Uh, the gesture for Cheerio is the same as the one that's hello. It's just a waving here. And the system has picked up both the hello and the Cheerio at the same time. We've just changed our algorithm for the background removal. And this is a bit of a, a test for it as well today. And I don't think it was liking the projector being right by. You are welcome to applaud if it comes up with the right gesture. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to sit. <laughs> um, I'll do some more. So there's the idea of me. There we go. And that comes up his eye. Some of the gestures are really obvious, and some of you may know the applause one because it's seen in, in some films and things like that. I'm fairly certain in the beach they use it for uh, clapping on the live wind. Um, but there are. <laughs> thank you, thank you. There are uh, less obvious signs, such as if I was to do this, then I imagine no one would know what it means until I lowered my hand and it comes up with the park. And that's the sort of gestures where if you're trying to communicate with someone that doesn't know sign language, you're going to run into real difficulties there. You'll notice there as well that it's came up with the park rather than just park. The actual gesture itself, the word it maps to is only park. But we use some natural language generation so that because it's a, a noun phrase, it's added on the word the, this becomes important down the line because if I was to gesture for um, I, let me try and think, I, I go park, let's go for that, I. So basically what I'm gesturing here is I go to the park, go park then that would be the three gestures that a signer would do because they don't gesture the littler words of things like the, things like and and that. But because we want our system to translate and keep the, make sure the signer is understood clearly, we do natural language processing. So if I do all three gestures, exactly the same gestures, so I go, added in the words so that it's translated it properly and um, you're, you're understood clearly and as well you, you don't come across as I'm not going to be very here, but you don't come across as being a bit thick you know that's always a worry that if it was just to come up I go park then anyone who uses vocal language regularly is going to think oh this person's clearly not you know, all there in the head as well which in the vast majority of cases isn't the case with signings and we want to make sure that Cross like that. It gets even more complicated when you add in the concepts of tense, which aren't really used in BSL. So you could say, um, I went to the park yesterday. You would just say, yesterday, I go park. And another sign would know instantly what you meant. And our system can cope with things like that as well. I'll show you that in a second. First off, I want to tell you about the overloading of gestures that Ernesto talked about. So regional variations. The word yesterday is done by putting your hand against your face and sliding it forward like this. Now that's something we have a little bit of trouble with just now. Um, it was working well in the other algorithm, but not so much in this one for the background removal. So probably my next bit of work when I get in tomorrow is going to be combining the two. Currently, we're having trouble detecting gestures in front of the face. So what I've done is overloaded the gesture for yesterday and made my own one instead. So if I raise my hand like this, I should get the word yesterday. And there you go, that gives the idea of the regional gestures as well, where if someone else's gesture for yesterday was different from my own, then they can use that one. So, let's go for the, the piece de resistance. I'm going to try, yesterday I go park, 
and it shoot them up yesterday, I went to the park. I should really tell you what it shoot them up after it came out. <laughs> 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 Alright, so let's get our hands in the right places first. Yesterday, I go park. Now there, Ooh. I went to the park yesterday. Okay, I have to and I think the system, it, it really speaks for itself. You know, people see the system and think, that's great, it would be, this would be such a handy system in so many places. I think almost everyone has a story of where they can see the system working. Uh, I did a presentation down in Surrey just last month, and we opened the, the stage up to questions, and someone actually put their hand up, stood up, and just said, I wish we had this seven years ago because they used to work in a school with deaf children and they, they had real trouble when they had to communicate and they just think it would be, be really handy for them. Um, I'll, I'll keep going. I have another, another good example of where it would be handy. This is I want hospital. Uh, I read cross. Okay, we missed the word want, which is like this to that. Cross. Is it decided Red Cross? <laughs> um, this is part of the natural language generation. Basically, much like English, one gesture, one word can have several meanings, and it is looking for the meaning that it thinks is most likely to be to be the the correct one. It's all based on probability and that. I know what it is. <laughs> okay, this one more try. My, my full attention, and then I'll explain why it's not working. I want go hospital. I want to go to hospital. There we go. First, I would prefer to work dead there, but I guess I go to hospital. I want to go to hospital. Makes, makes sense as well. Um, would you like me to explain what was going wrong there? That we was getting nurse hospital and that. Yeah. Okay. Occasionally, it was missing out one of the gestures. Particularly, it was one, which is a more complicated gesture. And this is a combination of bad signing on my part and the variable setting we have for the level of tolerance, you know how far away from the right position you can be in that. These sort of things are adjustable and we will need to see from user feedback again what levels are acceptable. We might find that users are really quite strict in where they sign. We might find that they're, they're really you know, say flamboyant you know, to try to do the same sign over here. That's something we're looking to get, to get feedback on. Um, the word hospital, the word nurse, the word Red Cross, these are all done with the same symbol, which is the cross on the arm. And that's why it was sometimes picking up nurse and sometimes pick up hospital. If I do the same gesture twice, then I would get two entries for it. And given the probability of these three words, this is the most likely combination. It's going to be hospital nurse as opposed to hospital red cross, red cross nurse, that sort of thing. These we can improve upon by having an full and extensive corpus of the British Sign Language. Um, I imagine many of have done probability and things like that, bigrams, trigrams, this sort of stuff. It's basically, if you take a huge amount of text and analyse it to see how often one word is followed by another, then you can guess rather accurately which word is going to be the next word given one word. Unfortunately, we can't use the corpuses that are already out there because BSL sentence structure is different from written sentence structure. So unless we insert words as well and then use that in the probability models, we're going to get results that are sometimes a bit strange. But if you start inserting your own words into things, you're, you're opening up a can of worms really for the, the probability models. And that's something we're looking to work in partnership with some of the deaf colleges and places like that to develop. So we'll have a corpus which Depending on the business model, which is up to the bosses, we might be able to share with other developers. We might keep it to ourselves. We'll see what the, the, uh, the guys in charge say. Oh, um, I've noticed the camera. Um, mm -hmm. 
you've actually mirrored it on yourself. Is there any reason for that? Because I'm assuming somebody that reads sign languages is looking at your left hand doing a gesture on your left side, but the camera is flipped around, which uh, would make reading the screen. Just because it makes it easier for me to see. That's the only reason. I could flip that image back around again and it wouldn't change the system. However, it does bring up an interesting point about your dominant hand, because it might be if you're left-handed, then you might do your hello gesture um, up on the left-hand side as opposed to the right. The system can cope with that. There's a little setting, you flip it over, and it uses the left hand as opposed to the right. And it does that for all the gestures. Um, so yeah, it's not actually affecting the system. It's just a reference. Another question I had is, I know my daughter got very early sort of sign language, but if you start with letters or words that it can pick up or you know your gesture that you spoke about that it's struggling with, mm -hmm. will it take letters as well so that you can build the words from scratch? No. <laughs> so, not at this point in time. Finger spelling, which is basically yeah. numbers yeah. and letters. If they are so complicated by the uh, by the way, I mean you have to think that you have a we have a, a 2D webcam in front of us. If you do something like that, how do you think that, uh, the, in terms of the taste, the webcam can see all the things? You should be doing this uh, in this way, possibly, which is altering completely the way a figure spelling, figure spelling is performed. So this is the limitation, but it's not a serious limitation, because you can always create your own sites for letters in a different way. Obviously, rather than having this, you can have something that's clearly visible to the webcam. Does it detect fingers? So, mm -hmm. I don't mean to be rude by that, but you know, so if I put that up, it would detect the difference between that and that. Um, it would really depend on the shape that is made. I think it's this. So, shape, so the, the, the profile, sure. the profile would be quite good between that and that. The yeah, and that. yeah, yes. that and that is a, a very definite distance yeah. difference. In, I'm saying it can't detect the difference. It will produce different sentences based on the other gestures. Yep. So if you were to do um, a series of gestures and then do this one, and then do a series of different gestures and then do this one, it would produce different sentences because it would look at your previous words which were the meaning of this one. Yep. So even though it might not be detecting the difference in the gestures, it produces a different word down the line. Yep. Can I also add something? In reality, we have a model that detects, uh, detects these tiny differences. Because the system in the background works by subsequent approximations. So first of all, you have a bounding rectangle, and then more and more details. What we have found is this is currently disabled in this version of seen here, because the level of sophistication and the level of approximation that you need, the level of precision that you need in doing this and differentiating, etc., etc., is uh, sort of uh, almost wiped out on the same level with background noise, noise that you can't see. You see sometimes that you see those squares, etc., etc. When they increase, it means that the, the background or the noise reaches, they really reaches a very high level. So we thought, okay, yes, what's the point? We, we will be there eventually because now that we have new stabilizing filters in place, the background noise should be down, should go down, and so we, we would like to re exploit that. Can you just point out as well, actually? See the, the dots my fingertips? Yep. That's doing what you're you're saying. Yeah. So it, it can see it, but in this system, we're not making any use of it. No. Um, but well, this is, as Ernesto said, we've got this new algorithm that's increased our, our ability to detect skin really well. So we're going to go back and look at exploiting uh, this information as well. Yeah. But you know, the levels of granularity that gives you it's is quite is brilliant. Quite. Yeah. If we can get this far with, with what we've got, then we'll turn it over. Because I mean, the, with, with your hands, you'd probably get the 26 combinations for letters mm -hmm. relatively easy, which is. The issue is when you've got hands on hands. Yeah, but what I'm saying is you could then just use, as um, as they said, substitute. just substitute them oh, yeah. so quite relatively easy. Yeah. If you yeah. can get that detail. Definitely, and then you can just spell them around. Can I ask about right the quality of the camera? If you used an iPhone, for example, normal iPhone, it's normal camera. Uh, would that be good enough for you, or are you demanding how many pixels do you need in order to do this kind of stuff? Reasonably, what are you using for up here? Uh, just now, I've got this Logitech camera. I can stop this just now. 
And this cost me about, I think it was 20 pounds. Yeah, it? but they're about yeah. Um, mm -hmm. This does say it's HD. But I think you say the, the inbuilt camera the, of the, the VR yes. phone. The ones for mobile phones, so the, 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 the ones for mobile phones generally work fine because they are much better camera quality than uh, mm -hmm. the cameras on board, the laptops and yeah. uh, netbooks, etc. etc. Yeah. So the problem with this technology is that uh, very cheap cameras, or you buy 50 for a pound, uh, they have high level of saturation and uh, color saturation basically affects the way you do the exposition, particularly some of the kits we use. Uh, but based to be honest with you, 20 quid is not bad. <laughs> So we're, we're running on, which is a, we may have done very well indeed, get all this demonstration. Perhaps you can have a few more questions about the demonstration and then move on to Ernesto. Would that, would that be right? Um, I was thinking that we take questions at the end after Ernesto has finished. Yeah, it's just while people take questions in mind. Anything directly to do with demonstration rather than. Well, can I just add to it? You don't really want to go for many pixels in the camera because it would increase the noise you were speaking about. And then not only that, but also the fact that uh, if you increase the size of the image, you have problems of uh, uh, far too much uh, com computational power that's required. So this the system slows down, but here it's real time, processes 30 frames per second. Mm -hmm. Because by the way, we have a world chain where we have a number of things going on both in series and in parallels, because Davis filters analyze the image from different viewpoints, and then they converge giving you a solution. It's not as simple as it looks like. So have yes, you, this is a pretty good thing. Have you considered using two cameras for better and recognition? We have, we have thought about that. We don't even have a branch. Uh, it was one of our students who did it as a project. Yep. The bottom line is, yes, it can be done, but in practice, if you really want to sell that, do you think that uh, mobile applications like smartphones, tablets, no way. No. Uh, computers, you know that it has always been a technical hassle to, to, to fit and let two webcams work uh, at the same time under Windows, because let's face it, most people, like it or not, the majority of people use Windows nowadays, not Unix, where putting two cameras and even four is not a problem. So our answer is yes, it's doable, no, it's better to avoid it if at all possible. Yeah. Stereo, stereo uh, vision would be fantastic to this big way. But the point is, uh, can you see people working around with two webcams? <laughs> Unfortunately. I was interested in the issue of the background. I mean, you, you, you're lucky or unlucky that you've got a sort of plain background of a particular colour. Mm -hmm. It's worse. Um, that would be better. If it was black. <laughs> but I was thinking no, if, if we were articulated. Oh, okay. Because we use a statistical algorithm where the more variety the background has, the better the algorithm works. So actually, with the old magnets that we had in place, please go give me a white surface or a completely homogeneous surface. Now is please go give me a mess. <laughs> So you're talking about scenarios in shops and that kind of thing? Exactly, and yes. This is not going to be a problem? No, actually. The, the other thing, with, you know that basically for signers, unfortunately, they are said where if you are white-skinned, wear a black shirt uh, so the hands can be more... Because we had tests in Doncaster many months ago and our young uh, testers, young uh, deaf uh, children in Doncaster age 10 to well, young adults age 18, and they were wearing more Garment, like we have so white things uh, like late day white scarves and brilliant things with stripes uh, Nebraska where the West begins and obviously the system was committing suicide because of that <laughs> because now even if you think stay still stay still means that you're still breathing the breathing causes movements in the fabric which are picked up by the camera but the human eyes doesn't matter, doesn't spot them and that was right now now the, the suggestion would be wear something colorful because basically the more colorful and the, the less uh, sounding of stigma all in black or all in white whatever the better it is for the system so we have the reverse of this what the motor reflection it doesn't matter because the algorithm basically cuts down the effects from reflection flickering from artificial light and all those sort of things which has wrecked havoc to the system in the past yes we don't care we have tested that. Actually, the next few days we're going around Union Street 
and doing also to test Tesco, Asda, Greg's, this and the other one. That's not Asda, they, uh, they are the Sainsbury, uh, Coop, uh, Greg's, uh, and uh, whoever else. Also, not not uh, Fred Beck, because otherwise we think we're going to get <laughs> something <laughs> out of you that don't we want to keep it. But that's the idea. So, so I wonder if, and I think, I think you had about another 10 slides ago, I don't know if you, if you wanted to use those. Rapidly, yes. Right, okay, so maybe we could do what it says, applause, cheerio, and thank Ron, because my joke is really something to do. So very, ru very roughly, the problems behind the scene. It looks simple, nice. What one, one functionality translate a language into text? Well, in the background, there are a number of uh, challenging issues. Dynamic background, we haven't demonstrated that, but basically you could have people agitating and moving in the background, which was not really behind the shoulders. But uh, as soon as you have one or two meters behind, which is a typical situation, like you are in the street, cars going, uh, people going on the pavement, etc., that's completely removed. Uh, issues about light, as we said, all light efforts have been suppressed. Uh, unwanted movement, by the way, if I do that, uh, basically the system takes my whole hand and arm. How can I make sure that I only pick up on the arm, on the hand, removing the, the rest of the arm? Because, I mean, the hand gesture means I look at the, uh, at the hand, I don't look at the arm, whatever the, whatever the arm is doing. How do I tell the computer to avoid picking up the arm? Individual form factors, we have fat short hands, long thin arms, they have to be taken into account. Skin color, it hasn't to be a racist system, so it works with people with whatever the color of the skin is, black, brown, yellow, white, pink, etc. Fine. Body shape, you see that we always we sign against the torso, I can be sort of thick, white torso thin people, small people, big people, it has to work independently. The keyword here is renormalization. Uh, signing style, people who do, for instance, hospital, typically, I remember one of the first trials, the system wasn't picking up hospital. Like shouting, hospital, the cross from here. No, it doesn't work like that. To some extent, we must allow for differentiating between this and this. So there has to be an element of fuzziness. This is the key word. Uh, okay, now the point is we have 1,200 gestures, more than roughly, more than that, depending. The whole vocabulary has to be picked up. Uh, in real side profiles, regional variations, and then the fact that you can add your own thing. So there, are, there is a, a whole lot of issues. And I mean, we have already seen the problem is how do you go from here hands to here. So you see, typically the point is uh, removing completely all the rest, which is a necessary material, identifying the hands uh, alone and not the arms, please, identifying the pin tip of the hands and identifying the gesture there. That's basically the topic of challenge. It's not the only challenge. Gesture, concepts, words, message. These are the, the three building blocks. Each of them, so basically the recognition from video of your hand gestures is a typical challenge, but also the creation of a sentence. Yesterday I went to the park, from yesterday B go park or incomplete information. By the way, you know that signers can also invert. I go park yesterday, yesterday park I go. There is an element of uh, flexibility, so there has to be a dynamic way of arranging and translating from a language to the other. Right, okay, there are other challenges here, it has to run Windows, Linux, Android with by the basic hardware. By the way, Android that costs less than 100, smartphones, very cheap one, not let me comment on that, I'm not saying which brand, fine. We gave it away because we thought, no, no way this is going to work, and we gave it away for charity, and then, mm, it worked. <laughs> Fine, okay. So basically, uh, now, end of the technical thing. Do you think this is a good thing? Yes. Do you like it? A number of people said yes, but there are also those ones, so for a range of uh, 
cultural uh, reasons don't particularly like or against uh, technology principle. Typical things, it can be done. I'm not saying who, academic linguists, <laughs> couple of them, one wrote me a ferocious letter, ah, you don't understand anything, it can be done. Who says that? I mean, I'm afraid, very humbly, we have done something, but you say it can be done. Typical object objection, it won't work. There is much more to sign languages than just hand gestures. In fact, uh, some signers also use this at all, because the most important meaning is conveyed by hands. Yes, we are looking at that. We are not doing it at the moment, yes. Most of the signers, the, my sister was deaf, so she signed. I didn't, I only learned the basic, you know, naughty words because I was a small boy. And um, a lot of them, while they're signing, will also mouth the words, will also speak the words. Emphasize, yes. It is. They, 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 but they will also, the people who weren't, who were previously I, um, were taught to lip read, will also uh, mouth the word, so they double sign, yes. they sign I went to park, but they'd also say I went to park, so it was just so I could dual communication yes. from a lot of the people that I saw. Have you used any of the... The bottom line, thing? yes, the bottom line is eventually we'll go there because the same technologies will be able to pick up facial expressions, so you understand that if you can do that, we can do the other. Yeah. The point is, we have to start from somewhere, no, no, maybe it's the resources. The bottom line is a number of signs really are blank faced. If you go, there is on STV, there are basically there is the signing also on BBC, and a number of them are very expressive, like myself. <laughs> Others are stone faced. That's it. So the bottom line is uh, well, maybe it is important, but it's not so important that you don't understand without that. And well, the other interesting one you are offending sign language. <laughs> Why? Uh, the other things are money spent on technology should be better spent on extra interpreters, interpreters and social workers. Well, these are some members, so I'm not putting names and some names here, I know who I mean. But uh, the voice of the deaf, deaf people, which are basically sort of a pressure group, and they obviously want to have it their own way, so they are there are principled objections here. Now, a number of these criticisms come from vested interests like interpreters. Interpreters don't understand that we want, don't want to put them out of the job. We are not replacing uh, automatic scanners at the supermarket in place of uh, uh, the people there. So it's simply that in a, there are few uh, scarce and expensive resources and in a number of situations they can't be used. They're not there, they're too expensive or uh, it takes 55, time for 55 hours to book one. So that's the replacement. In court, in critical situation, they'll be there. So their market niche is going to be preserved. We are not kicking them out of job. They don't understand that, and so there is all this sort of thing. There are other vested interests. Other vested interests, I'm sorry to say, but are the people who haven't been involved in all these. Oh, you didn't put me in, uh, so I'm telling you that this thing is rubbish. Fine, okay, well. Right, anyway, we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of interest. We are filtering the whole thing at the moment with uh, the Doncaster College for the Deaf. We have charities on board at the national level. We are uh, beginning filtering with the police. We have a number of institutions that are really excited. We have the Employers Council on Disability in London that's thinking of this as a good thing. You, you know basically that in uh, all post offices and other places there are the, uh, those antiquated machines where for deaf people you can put it there. So uh, there is a duty of uh, a care from the big institutions, governmental corporations to do something for the part of the community that has disabilities. Now this is a very good way of doing a good job there rather than providing a non-working piece of equipment that's 50 years old and that's based on the fact that it amplifies uh, uh, for people who are culturally deaf, so later in life, but not those profoundly deaf. Those profoundly deaf that only sign don't know what to do with uh, the, the, the device for amplifying the, the sound. So that's it. Right, I just want to cut short because I mean I understand that you want to go home. Now, things that we're planning to do, facial expressions, surprise, surprise, Performance, particularly on Android, you know, the bottom line is this stuff here is much less powerful than this stuff here at the moment. I think in one or two years' time, possibly the curve is going the other way around, but at the moment, we will reach maybe in a year the same way. I have seen for 
thinks uh, 2.5 gigahertz uh, of clock speed, that's fantastic. So we are going there, but at the moment it's still an uh, issue. Automated profiling, so the point is you have one of these, you go to the supermarket and you say this is my way of signing with all my vocabulary and now I want to complain because the roast beef was rubbish <laughs> <laughs> and you do your own thing. So you don't have to calibrate, you don't have to adjust, you don't have to do things like I was doing okay, my sign, my hand, etc. etc. Uh, overloaded just gestures, you know, I told you about policemen, prostitutes, etc. We are doing something, but there is much more because many gestures have up to seven meanings. The number of movements that you can do in uh, the 2D space is limited. So, to create 1200 words, a number of uh, gestures must have very similar meaning. How to be ambiguate? Frequency based. So, you need to have a corpus. There is no corpus for PSL, there is a corpus for written text. Right. The other thing, last but not least, well, the uh, deaf people said it's so good. You are creating those uh, to allow the users, uh, the uh, speaking users, to understand us deaf. What about us deaf understanding the speakers? And avatar, we have already concept uh, uh, Sorry, we have already concept proof that. So you write. You uh, sorry. Somebody writes. The right. The person says. Uh, I want what is your name and then avatar signs what is your name. Easier, technology is already there, sort of. Uh, we have concept proof that, so that would close the loop and the circle and allow full two ways communication. Because basically, the guys from the government, when they come out with the, the PSLT, they said text to sign, uh, sorry, sign to text, they couldn't care about the rest, we said, look, you know, we got feedback from the, uh, from the real people and they said they want the other way around. Oops, we didn't know that. We basically didn't have the, 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 the resources to do a full thing. We did a proof of concept and basically our plan is, if this is commercially good, we can use the money we get from it to subsidize the development of that. Because really it's not our intention to make millions with a social application like this. Okay, so and I think that's me. But we wouldn't mind. Yes, we have to survive. As somebody said when they had uh, whatever the problems in the US, people need their paycheck, they need to eat. So at the end of the day, the government needs to have some income. From our, the, our plan here is really not to make uh, money with that, but to reinvest anything that we get out of here in the improvement of this technology. Reason? Because basically the improving of the improvement of this uh, challenging technology can be reused in other contexts. And in fact, we, are, we have uh, monitoring uh, systems for carrying in the visible labor, etc., where we use the very same technologies to understand what you're doing at any point in time and to see whether where what you're doing is normal or out of normal. So basically, I mean, there is a benefit in working here because there is a fallout in other fields. That's me. I try to condense uh, to make a condensate the day. <laughs> Brilliant. We can very well time. Uh, we've got time for a few more questions and more, more general things. Uh, anybody who hasn't asked anything before? Can you ask? Um, you've mentioned the word corpus a few times. I'm not sure if everybody will know what it is, but it's paragraphs and text. Have you thought of using the BBC programs where they're actually doing the sign language and the text and bottom? That yes, that was an idea. Uh, obviously, there are two issues there. The quality of the image that you get is not fantastic, but it's very small. And uh, obviously, the other thing is you would have to run it uh, for a long time. So, what we thought is uh, rather to engage with the University College London, we have them do the job. This was a trick. Uh, ESRC, who wants to know the, the thing, is uh, uh, extremely delighted to have real companies sort of uh, pushing for these kind of things in that particular sector. So we are in discussion with them for them to do that part. Because you see, we have even tried to use uh, uh, standard text corpora from downloaded from the web, the ones the same that Google uses, for instance. It's different. Because, I mean, uh, me yesterday go cinema is not the same thing in frequency terms and yesterday I went to the cinema, so you can't use it. It's like using a frequency in German to address a problem in English. 
even then, I think the text you're talking about is that the written text, so it's like the subtitles. Yeah, yeah. In which case, it's already written in written English. Uh, uh, from memory, anyway, it's not just the key words or the exact same yeah. words that would be gestured. It's the gestured words we need an, an exact translation for, uh, translation for Bayon, rather than sort of an uh, interpretation. We have a sticker though, which has, has been never used. We have a sticker to transform the sentence the human way. Yesterday went to the cinema to things like yesterday I, me, go cinema, also changing, etc. etc. But we went that way for a while and we said, no, it's not worth the candle. We don't have the resources to do that. Let somebody else who's better than us do this technical, very specific thing. Well, uh, I quite heard you say that the SBRI only supports 50% of the uh, funding. No, they support 100% the of the funding. Oh, okay, I misheard you. Right. It is uh, uh, because it's a specific call, it's not my responsive mode. So basically, they say, we want you to do this. Apply, do you have an idea? If the answer is yes, the amount of money is fixed. So they tell you, you're going to do this with this amount of time, this time scale. Can you do it? Answer yes or no. If yes, Tell us why, how, <coughs> and that was it. And believe me, the money they are forking out is not comparable to academic. Yeah. There is That's not full, full economic costing. Uh -huh. you, don't, you don't have to cover the 40% overhead. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even without 40%, they yeah. would really look at the real cost and say, yeah. uh, I'm putting 75,000 pounds per year, full equivalent. Uh, Look at my finger, answer is no, that is basically the message. They were really very like, tough. Anyway, that's it. Take it a minute. Well, maybe that's a chance to perform a close meeting and then people can come up and ask and, and go there. So, uh, can I thank Ernesto uh, once again and Brian particularly? Uh, it's very brave indeed to do live demos. <laughs>